You're listening to WCAT Radio, your home for authentic Catholic programming. Welcome to WCAT. I'm Kiki Latimer, and I'm your host for the Catholic Bookworm. And I'm very happy to have with me today Anthony Kolenk. Welcome, Tony. Thank you, Kiki. It's so nice to be here. Cool. Um, author of primarily that we're going to talk about today, amongst a few other things, the Harwood Mysteries, uh, chapter books for sort of older teens, right? Yeah, maybe uh, grade 6 through 12, uh, age 10 and up, I think, is the way Loyola pitches it. Okay, wonderful. Well, I love the book, so I read it over the last couple of days and really enjoyed it. It was a fun read. So um, how about you start us off with a prayer? Uh, Sure. Um, In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, let the words of our mouth be pleasing to you. Jesus, we trust in you. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So, Tony, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, first of all, thanks for having me on the show. I really appreciate uh, being here and what you do. Uh, it's always great when uh, people focus on Catholic fiction and uh, nonfiction books because uh, there's just not enough people out there looking at that stuff. Um, but I am uh, actually I'm a retired Air Force lieutenant colonel. I spent 21 years in the Air Force, uh, started enlisted as a firefighter and uh, ended as a lawyer, actually, as an Air Force <laughs> jack. And so that prepared me when I retired to start teaching in law schools. So I've been teaching in law schools since 2012. And currently, I run the Veterans and Service Members Law Clinic at Ave Maria School of Law in Naples, Florida, Uh, the most devout, uh, most uh, Catholic law school in the country, uh, most conservative also in all the polls. So uh, we're in Naples, uh, really kind of South Florida on the Gulf, and uh, enjoying my time teaching here. Um, I have uh, my wife and I, uh, Elisa, we've been married for 35 years. We've got five kids, but they're pretty much all grown. My oldest or my youngest actually uh, graduated college last year. And I have three grandkids, uh, one who's 17 uh, going into her senior year. And and uh, the littlest one is still in the womb, actually. He's going to be uh, born in October. So uh, we're very blessed with that. And so that's uh, that's just a little bit about me, uh, kind of outside of my writing life. Sounds good. Well, my oldest grandchild is also 17, but I've got 13 of them. Oof, so uh, okay. <laughs> got kids coming out our ears. In fact, everybody's going to be here tomorrow for the 4th of July. So it uh, should be interesting. So, yeah. So... The Harwood Mysteries. Now, I've just read book one. How many are there in the series so far? So we, uh, Loyola Press is the publisher. And at this point, uh, we have six books in the series. The, the final book is coming out this December, just in time for Christmas uh, gift season. And uh, book six is supposed to be the final book in the series. So when I wrote it last year, I wrote it to sort of sum up the whole series it kind of it's the capstone and the climax of everything so in the first book which is the one i read over the last two days and loved just had a really as an adult even though that was a chapter book had just a really fun time reading it it was thank uh, you it was just delightful uh, you introduce alexander zan does he stay with the other five books oh yeah the series uh, follows zan i guess now is an opportune time to just put the cover up here for you. Um, oh, cool. cool cover. I have a PDF, so I didn't get to see the cool book. Oh, yeah. Loyola did an amazing job with, with the books in general. There's maps, as you know, in the inside. And so you could kind of see the whole world of uh, Zan in there. Of course, I'm not getting to the map. But, you know, you can see uh, Zan's whole world. It's 12th century England. So it's it's historical fiction. And, uh, you know, the whole series follows Zan as he, uh, you know, kind of grows up. He starts off at 11 years old in book one. By the time we get to the end of book six, he's 15 going on 16. And uh, him and the two other main characters, you've already met the first one, Lucy, uh, in ah, book yes. one. <laughs> she uh, she stays throughout the series. And there's another oh, right. character, <laughs> Christina, who you would meet in book two. Uh, and she's also kind of throughout the series. So even though the series sort of follows Zan as my main protagonist, 
I really wanted to write a few very strong and, and contrasting uh, female characters in there um, for our for our girl readers. Um, and so, um, in fact, I have a whole series of Lucy short stories that I, I write. We could talk about later. Okay. Well, I think your girl readers will like Zan as well. <laughs> In fact, they might like him more than they like Lucy. (laughs) (laughs) He's quite cute. He's quite sweet. It's really interesting to see him um, grow in virtue. Um, So let's talk about that. I mean, you you bring a lot of, first of all, you you bring a lot of um, understanding of Catholic teaching and Catholic nomenclature and things like that into the book. So it's obviously a, a teaching method as well, which is beautiful. Yeah, uh, what what I wanted to do with this series, just to kind of kind of set the stage, you know, I started writing this when Harry Potter was, you know, in full bloom, and mm-hmm. um, you know, and 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 I like Harry Potter, you know, just fine actually. Um, you know, I really have enjoyed most of those books, but I, I wanted to write something that I know there were a lot of parents who, uh, you know, had concerns about their kids reading things like Harry Potter, and as you probably know, if you follow mainstream fiction um, for kids, it's only gone downhill from there as far as concerns that parents might have. Uh, and there's so many agendas that are, are out there right now. So I wanted to write a series that really would be safe for families. Um, I wanted it to, you know, have the same kind of a vibe as Harry Potter. You know, it's like spooky mysteries, but set in a historical setting, 12th century England, where there was a lot of cool stuff going on in history. And you're right, I wanted, we were a homeschooling family for most of our kids' lives. And at the time I started Shadow in the Dark, I wanted it to be a, a book that not only had good themes and a great story and that would keep kids, you know, on the edge of their seats and all that. But I also wanted it to introduce people to the Middle Ages, to what life was like, you know, um, living in England, um, you know, what what monastic life was like in the Middle Ages and how important that was to Western civilization. So especially book one has a lot of world building that I do there. And, uh, and in fact, they're using book one in a lot of Catholic schools in their religion or, uh, you know, uh, English curricula as sort of a supplement, which is awesome. That's that's kind of, you know, one of my ulterior motives when I started the series. Yeah. Well, one of the things I liked about the book, I mean, I did read a few of the Harry Potter books. Um, I found it very interesting on, on a number of levels, just mentioning, since we were mentioning Harry Potter, was that it began as a children's series, but it certainly didn't end as a children's series. You know, so that was always a weird thing to me, that you have book one is for children, book two is still for children, but by the time you get to book six, like, children should not be reading this, you know? So you know that was always odd. You know, what's interesting is that might be odd, but it's also kind of a natural progression because I think if you were to go on and continue reading through the series, and especially when you get to book six, um, you know, it, it, because the character ages and the writing sort of grows uh, in, in some ways, not quite to the extent as happened in Harry Potter, but book six, uh, actually Loyola, I think, is is uh, marketing book six for ages 13 and up uh, because you know, it gets, he's older, you know, he hits, uh, there's some serious, you know, some serious spooky stuff going on in book six. Um, and, and so mine does that a little bit. And, and yeah, I guess in some ways it's a little odd, but as the writer, it, I, having done it now, I kind of see how JK Rowling would have had that happen because your character is growing and so, and maturing and your, and your writing sort of matures with your character. Interesting. What you have that that Harry Potter doesn't have, I think, is this this clear delineation of good and evil. Um, not that your characters are perfect, um, but that there's a clear overall picture of good and evil. Um, so that you you want to do good rather than well, you can do evil if you know the means justify if the end justifies the means. You kind of have that in Harry Potter. Um, you make it clear that the ends don't justify the means. Um, Right. Like and a delineation of right and wrong. Exactly. I mean, that's that's what I was going for. And like you said, the characters are not perfect. Zan, uh, he's he's sweet in book one because book one starts with him losing his memory and then getting, you know, he's 11 years old. He loses his memory. He winds up at this monastery being raised by the Benedictine monks of Harwood Abbey. Hence the name of the series. Uh, 
you know, and so throughout the book, you know, he's trying to find his family. He doesn't know who he is. Um, and there's all of that. And you could see he's a good kid and he's a sweet kid, but, uh, but he's not perfect. And as the series goes on, like in book two, the Haunted Cathedral, he really, you know, struggles with forgiveness and anger and, and things like that. So the characters are definitely not perfect. But like you said, at the end of the day, you know, these, these books are written from a Catholic worldview. You know, they're, they're redemptive. The arc of the whole series is really about vocation and what does God want for my life and living for the values of, you know, of God, not the values of this world. Um, and because I said it sort of in this organic, you know, monastic, middle, medieval, you know, world, a lot of those themes can come out very organically without me having to, you know, fake it by making up a bunch of religious things. It's just part of the fabric of society at this time, especially, you know, with the people that Zan and, and Lucy and Christina are exposed to. And so it, it hopefully comes across as, as, you know, fairly natural and, um, you know, and so that's well, what I'm I loved, I, there was a scene at the end where he's really given the opportunity to, for forgiveness to to forgive, um, but he doesn't. He, you know, he still isn't ready to forgive. And I really love that scene because it was realistic. Um, it was like forgiveness. I mean, I teach forgiveness that they're used to in an ethics class, and forgiveness is often, especially big forgivenesses, are is a process. You don't forgive the big stuff overnight, you work at it, you head in that direction. And you can see he's, well, the very fact that he was willing to go and see this person at all is a step forward, but he doesn't embrace this person or embrace the concept of forgiveness yet. And that you left it there. And I like that. Yeah. And I left it there quite on purpose because book two picks up right with that theme and, you know, kind of one step forward, two steps back. Most of book two Zan really is struggling with, you know, when when is it okay to forgive somebody who's done something horrible to you and your family? And, you know, how can you do that? Jesus, you know, talking about love your enemies and things like that. And Zan struggles with that. And, and you kind of live with Zan struggling with it. And as, as many of us maybe have discovered in our lives, sometimes if you don't forgive, you're the one who winds up getting... Uh, you know, hurt by that is yourself. And right. you know, sometimes you got to learn those kinds of lessons in life. And I wanted like my characters to be able to learn those lessons uh, with also the, the, you know, kind of the hope being that people reading them would be like, oh yeah, you know, you really can't hold on to your anger because, you know, that could lead to bad things. And, and that, that was, was it? My yes. Somebody said, what is it? Not forgiving is like drinking poison and hoping the other person dies, right? <laughs> yeah, so there's some of that. So, so yeah, I, and I teed it up in book one at the end, um, you know, partly to be realistic, but also partly because I knew that was a theme I wanted to keep exploring. That's, that's an important theme. A big theme in the book is this name change. You know, he doesn't know his name, so he's given a name. Then eventually he finds out his name, but he doesn't go back to that name. And I, I'm always fascinated by by name change. I mean, we have, of course, Paul becoming, I mean, Saul becoming Paul. Um, you know, name change is a theme both in the Old and New Testament. Um, I got my name changed. I started off as Kirsten Ingrid. Um, my parents called me Kim was my nickname because it was Kirsten Ingrid Monk. And then when I was two, a friend of the family met a woman in Hawaii named Kiki. And when he came back, he said, I looked like her. And he started calling me Kiki. And it stuck. <laughs> and so I've always been fascinated. I, if, if my mother yelled Kirsten Ingrid, I knew I was in big trouble <laughs> or something. <laughs> you know? So I'm always fed. And so I've, Kiki has, I think two people in my adult life have called me Kirsten. Um, but everyone else has called me Kiki and I stuck with Kiki as my professional name, um, when I moved into writing and it's just who I am. So I'm always fascinated by name changes. Um, so I was charmed by this one, you know, and it, first, of course he gets Alexander, but you change it and he gets shortened to Zan, which works really well. Um, so talk to us about the concept of name change and. 
Yeah, you know, as we were talking before we started, I, you know, I've had my own name change stories over, you know, my my full name is Anthony Barone Colank and no H in the Anthony. And that was tough, especially because my mom called me Anthony my whole life, even though it was spelled Anthony. So that became a, a struggle for me. I eventually in my 20s or 30s, I just gave up and I was like, I'm just going to go by Tony from now on when I'm talking to people. And that's worked out pretty well. But I still go with my full name. And in fact, at one point, I, I wanted to write under the pen name Anthony Barone, because I also think Colank is kind of an awkward name to, to live with. Um, so eventually, I had to sort of make peace with my name and, and sort of accept it. But, you know, the monks uh, take on new names when they come into their the religious order. And so and, and really, book one, and, fr- and frankly, the whole series is about identity and vocation. Really, it is. Um, and it's about Zan's identity. Who am I as a person? You know, what's in a name, if you will? He doesn't know his name for most of the first book. But like you said, when he finally gets the opportunity to discover who his true identity was, and he gets his memory back, spoiler alert, um, you know, he still has to you know, look at, well, who am I moving forward after everything that's happened to me in my life? And what does it mean? You know, what what does my name mean to me and, and who I am? And honestly, I take that same theme and it, it sort of is woven in all of the other books. And uh, And when I finally got done writing book six this summer or last summer, I realized, you know what, I need to I need to make peace with that name change, you know, with my character too. And so it really kind of comes back at the very end of book six too, as a uh, sort of a, a kind of a bookend, if you will, of, of this idea of, you know, who are we and who do we want to be? And, and, you know, how does what we call ourselves or how, what other people call us, you know, um, what does that mean in, in our true identity? Yeah, I'm not sure a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. <laughs> Sometimes I think words matter, you know, that ability to name. Another theme that I that I loved in the book, uh, and again, I've only read the first one, Shadow in the Dark, um, was that, you know, he starts out with amnesia. He's been bopped on the head, to say the least. He's been beaten up. He's He's lost his memory of who he is, but as his memory starts to come back, um, especially, you know, he really wants to know who his parents are, that his, his memory of his mother comes back um, just with not a face or a name, but a sense of her loving presence that she loved, that he was loved. Um, And it, it it made me think, I, I take care of a woman who has Parkinsonian dementia um, mm-hmm. And at this point, she remembers, she doesn't remember a lot, um, and she doesn't have a lot of vocabulary left, um, but she does remember her prayers. She's been a devout Catholic all her life, and if I were sitting at the table and there's there just seems to be nothing there, if I start to pray the Hail Mary, she will start to pray it with me. Um, so that that deep sense of love, that God loves her, um and and the prayers are are still deeply within her and and I thought about that as I read Shadow in the Dark that as you know as Zan gets his mem- little bits and pieces the first thing that's there is that he knew he was loved that his mother loved him I thought that was very sweet um, yeah you know mothers are so important and a mother's love is important and as Catholics, you know, obviously we we think about the Blessed Mother as our mother and and the importance of her love. So yeah, th- those are kind of, I think, themes that, again, yeah, like and anybody who's had parents and hopefully loving parents, you know, could identify with that. I actually lost my father at a very young age. I was um, actually I was Zan's age um, when my father died. And uh, and so my mom kind of went on, you know, as a single mom raising three kids and so, I, you know, I think I, that's always stuck in my mind, too, just the love of a mom and how important moms are. And, um, you know, these themes of like loss that you can see, you know, in Shadow in the Dark. Um, and actually, those themes kind of continue throughout uh, the books. I remember at another interview, I was talking about this with somebody and I realized, you know what, this idea of loss comes up a lot and, you know, pe- you know, losing people close to you. And 
And partly that's probably because of my own life experience, but also I think, you know, all of us deal with loss in our lives. And I thought that was an important, I think it's important for us to try to understand how do we cope with loss and what does it mean and how does it interact with our faith? You know, like, you know, people who like to blame God for everything they lose, you know, with, with kind of a very short sighted view of, you know, what, what life is about or what the world is about. And I kind of try to have my characters grapple with those kinds of themes as we, you know, continue through the series. Was it C.S. Lewis that said, you know, we write about the monsters, whether they're, you know, Godzilla or death or not because they don't exist, but to show that they can be defeated, that they can be overcome. And I've always loved that. I think it's important. Um, I mean, there was a, an attempt, I think, 20 years or so ago to sort of clean up all the fairy tales, you know, take out the death and the doom and the monsters and make pretty stories for children. Um, but then they don't learn how to deal with the monsters and the monsters come <laughs> in all of our lives. Um, yeah. So it's, it's, the and monsters are important. They are. And and they're important in my books, by the way, because I wanted them to be kind of suspenseful books and, you know, mysteries, even though they're sort of historical fiction, a little light on the history and heavy on the fiction. But um, but still, the history is there in different areas throughout the series. But I wanted them to kind of be spooky books and um, or suspenseful books for the older uh, teens, perhaps. Uh, but I do want to mention because uh, parents often will look at the covers of the books and the names of the books you know, book two is the haunted cathedral, you know, book four is the merchant's curse, and it's got a picture of a witch on the front. So we could talk about all those. But, um, you know, all of these books, uh, at the end of the day, are very not supernatural, nothing occult, nothing that parents or families need to worry about. They've all the books, all five of the books that have been out so far have all won, you know, gold medal awards from Catholic you know, groups like the Association of Catholic Publishers, the Catholic Media Association. Um, we've got 15 awards, I think, for the series, mostly from, you know, family-friendly type groups. So right. the books themselves are are very good for families. But I, I needed there to be sort of this very kind of suspenseful, spooky element to really get the vibe that I was going for with the series and to, you know, draw in the kinds of readers that we have today. I mean, that's, they're, you know, they're attracted to that kind of thing. And so I wanted that to, um, to also be part of, you know, the storylines. Well, I thought you did a great job. And you're also just a good writer. I mean, the books are fun to read. They're, they're, they're just well written. So it was delightful. I had a great yeah. afternoon yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. You got to read the other ones because they get they, they even get better as they go. <laughs> now I'm thinking I've got to get the set and just go through them and then share them with the grandkids, of which I have a zillion. So, <laughs> so you have another well, the beginnings of possibly another series coming out. Correct. We have Penny and the Stolen Chalice. Yes, and if it's all right, can I share my screen real quick? Yeah, go right ahead. All right, you can get Tell the technology if, uh... to work. <laughs> Let's see if it works. Are you looking at Penny and the Stolen Chalice right now? Ah, yes, I am. Cool. So this is a book, not from Loyola Press does my Harwood Mysteries series, but um, because I've, I've made a lot of contacts through the Catholic Writers Guild and Catholic team books uh, and things like that, um, one of the editors at our Sunday Visitor reached out to me and said, hey, we would really like to put out a a younger chapter book. So this is maybe grades like three through six or three, you know, three through five might be the best audience for something like this. And they wanted there to be an emphasis on something with the Eucharist and the mass for the, uh, you know, Eucharistic revival. And they were like, do you have anything like that? And I was like, no, I don't have anything like that, you know, but if I did, and then I just started spitballing, you know, the story that turned into Penny and the Stolen Chalice and it's written from the uh, the vantage point of a sixth grade girl. It's written in first person, so it, that was fun to put myself in my sixth grade girl, you know, mind frame. <laughs> and uh, and Penny is there with the glasses. Although it was kind of funny because they never mentioned glasses in the book, but they drew her with glasses. So I thought that was fun. Uh, her friend Jaden <clears throat> is next to her. Uh, he's her best friend. He's an altar server. And uh, and there's Father. Uh, Bala, the Indian priest at the parish. So it takes place in a Catholic school 
Penny's not actually Catholic, but Jaden is is very Catholic. And uh, and so when the chalice gets, you know, what happens is at the beginning of the book, the fire alarm gets pulled during a school mass. And after everybody evacuates, somebody comes in and steals the chalice from the altar while it still has the consecrated wine in it. And so that becomes a big, you know, um, plot point in the book. Why would somebody steal a chalice from the altar, like such a sacrilegious type of a thing? And Penny and Jaden basically have to discover, you know, who stole the chalice and why. And it all gets sort of wrapped up in this um, idea of what is the chalice mean during mass. And, you know, she doesn't know anything because she's, you know, newly at the school. She's not a Catholic. And so she's also able to sort of be, you know, um, discover some of these things about the Mass and the Eucharist uh, as she's figuring out who stole this chalice. So it, it was a lot of fun to write this one. It's, it's definitely a few years younger age uh, range for reading. Um, but uh, this is also a fun contemporary, you know, Catholic mystery. Hey, so you get to write from the point of view of a what is it? A twelve-year-old girl? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I, I guess I, I have a very, uh, I have a very soft side to me, and I've, you know, um, four daughters, and now I'll have two granddaughters. Um, so, uh, you know, for some reason, it's not, <laughs> not, you know, strange. I wrote my Lucy short stories also in the first person from Lucy's point of view, and she's just twelve and thirteen in most of those stories too. Um, so. Yeah, I, I I don't know if I'm if I'm exactly getting a twelve year old girl's mind right, but uh, you know, I do my <laughs> sounds best. Sounds like fun, though. It sounds like fun. <laughs> well, I'll look forward to that one as well. So you're connected with something called as well as called CatholicTeens dot com. CatholicTeenBooks dot com. Um, Catholic so what, what happens books. is, yeah. Uh, it's a really good resource. I would really encourage your your you know readers, uh, your listeners to go and and check it out because there's about there are 17 of us now, 17 of us Catholic authors, all writing for like middle school and high school age students or kids, um, and and not all the books. I mean, they're all Catholic in their worldview, but not all of them are ex- you know expressly religious. Um, But there's a lot of really, I mean, a lot of parents are like, well, where do I find good Catholic fiction for my kids that they actually will want to read? They don't want to read, you know, another saint book, maybe, or they, some of the older, you know, fiction just is not written the way, you know, that's accessible to our kids today. So there's a bunch of us out there doing it. So CatholicTeenBooks.com is really just a bunch of authors from all different publishers. Some of us are self-published, some of us with traditional publishers. And we're just all writing for that age group. Um, and you'll find everything on there um, from dinosaur, you know, uh, dystopian dinosaur adventures to like teenage romances to sort of sports types books to historical books, Civil War, um, you know, my my series back in the mid- Middle Ages. And, and there are some saints books on there, too, like biography type um, stories of the saints. And we even put out different anthologies every uh, every two years. We have about four different short story anthologies uh, on different topics, you know, different themes um, that a bunch of us authors, you know, collaborate on. So it's a great resource. Um, you'll find my my books there, but you'll find a lot of other books there too. Uh, and I know a lot of Catholic parents often ask, like, "Well, where do I find this stuff?" Um, and that's, I think, so a great Catholic. Question. Teenbooks.com. Yep, just like it sounds, CatholicTeenBooks.com. I mean, I know when my kids were growing up, where our kids are about the same age, um, you know, it was the Narnia Chronicles, uh, the Lord of the Rings, which when they were a little older, there was Madeline Langell's books, and that was about it as far as, you know, really solid. After that, I can remember my kids, <laughs> we were stuck with the Goosebumps series. Um Right. You know, and that's, that's the reason I started writing, you know, uh, this series is it, it didn't seem like there was a lot out there. And a lot of the other um, I'm actually the only guy out of 17 authors. It's like me and 16 women, uh, most of who are like you know, <laughs> homeschooling moms or not all of them. But, you know, and, and and they all started writing for the same reasons that I did um, was, you know, they didn't see enough out there for these age ranges that they felt comfortable with as as parents. 
And so they wanted more wholesome, good valued, you know, um, you know, religious and not necessarily religious, but, um, you know, good right. value. Good values. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's wonderful. It's wonderful. Yeah. You also go into middle school classrooms to speak, right? About writing and. I do. And me and actually a lot of our, our authors are glad to do that, but I love Great it. Soul. <laughs> no, it is. Um, well, um, I mean, now I I'm, well. I'm a law school, I'm a law school <laughs> professor. So I've been teaching, uh, you know, between law school and even in the Air Force, I taught at the Air Force Academy. That's kind of scary, teaching uh, Air Force cadets. So if there's any <laughs> oh, yeah, you can survive student, that. <laughs> an Air Force cadet. But um, no, but I, I love going into the middle school classrooms. Sometimes I'll do it in person if I'm, you know, um, in the area or in Florida. Um, I've also done some in Zoom for, you know, Canada, Canada classrooms, California, all over the place. And and I like to talk. Well, really, I, I t- cater it to whatever the the teacher wants. But um, oftentimes, what I wind up talking about is um, writing and how to write good fiction and good stories. And I talk about something called the hero's journey, which is sort of a an age old um, you know template for how storytelling is done. And I like to show them how that sort of uh, that that sort of universal. A template really applies to most stories that they read, including like romances, science fiction, fantasy, you know, they're all sort of, you know, kind of this hero's journey um, idea that really it talks, it's really, it's about exploring who we are as people, how we change and how we have to, you know, confront the, you know, conflicts and, you know, challenges in our lives. (laughs) Yeah. The monsters in our lives. And, and, you know, every story sort of does that with, with a different twist. So I like to talk about that. I like to talk about the Middle Ages or the Crusades and things like that. Um, so we have a lot of fun uh, with that. So if any of your, uh, you know, folks who, who watch the show, uh, you know, have kids in middle school, hey, get, tell them to have their teacher invite me. I'd love to come talk to their class. Well, what kind of questions do the kids ask you? Like your they, favorite questions. They always ask me, what's my favorite book of my series? Um, they also ask me, you know, like, how long does it take to write? And, you know, where do I get ideas from? And uh, those kinds of things. It, it's actually, it's amazing how interested they are in the writing process. Um, you know, it, uh, a lot of, you know, kids, even though, you know, kids aren't reading or writing like they used to. And, and that's definitely the perception out there. But kids are just as imaginative as they always were, and they they want a place to be able to you know express themselves. And so I try to you know encourage that, whether it be writing or if they're making little YouTube videos or whatever they're doing, drawing, writing poetry. Um, but yeah, they're always interested in the process, which is pretty neat. So, which book is your favorite book? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll show you. Let me let me show you a few covers real quick here. You saw book one already, and you read that one. Book two is the Haunted Cathedral. Actually, you can see uh, Lucy and Zan on the on the front of book two. This was my favorite for a long time um, because you know they go, they travel from the Abbey to Lincoln. They have to confront this uh, this idea: is this ghost of a little girl haunting this cathedral? Zan is also struggling with the loss of his family, and hey, is there a way for me to still you know have contact with my family? So this one was my favorite for a long time, um, the Haunted Cathedral. Um, but I don't know. I think it's been superseded. Uh, book three was the Fire of Eden. This guy almost looks like Gandalf from the Lord of the Rings. But book three was a lot of fun to write. It's a jewel thief book, actually. Zan and Lucy have to figure out, you know, who stole this jewel. And this is one of the suspects is this magician guy who lives, you know, uh, outside this area. Um, but... I don't know that book three was ever one of my favorites. The one that I think is still my current favorite is book four, The Merchant's Curse. Um, This one has a lot of presence of Christina. um, And there's sort of a kind of a sweet uh, romance thing that goes on and starting in book four and five. Um, But this one has this, uh, actually, uh, you know, the reason why this one's my favorite uh, is because it's based on the book of Ecclesiastes. I don't know if you uh, if you've read Ecclesiastes in the Old Testament, but 
it's the one that starts off vanity of vanities. Everything is vanity. And it's, you know, King Solomon's voice and wisdom. And, and, and so the theme in book four is all about the different vanities of our lives that we get sidelined by and how none of it really matters in the end. We're all going to die. Even the pursuit of wisdom, King Solomon, you know, says in that book, mm-hmm. uh, isn't uh, there. So that one is pretty fun. Um, and then book five, the one that just came out last October, is sort of my homage to Agatha Christie novels, my murder at Penwood Manor. It's a murder mystery. And this guy on the front here is a crusader recently returned from the Holy Land on crusade. And he becomes the prime suspect in a murder that Zan and Christina and Lucy have to solve. Um, And this one I like, I mean, I like all of them really, but I think book four is still my favorite. I'm not sure because book six hasn't come out. And book six is going to be called The Devil's Ransom. And it's it's definitely going to be uh, kind of the big bang of the series. Um, and I may bump book four out as my favorite. Uh, most... <laughs> so when does book six come out? Because I want to order them as a set here. <laughs> Do they, yeah, are they out, to be, is there a set? You know, I've been asking Loyola if if they're going to do a box set. I don't know that they're going to, or at least that they're going to do it immediately. But um, book six comes out December 3rd, 2024. So just in time for Christmas. Christmas. They really should do a box set because it's such a nice way to give a gift. You know, if you give the Narnia Chronicles to someone, you give it as a box set. And it's just from your lips to Loyola's ears. But. Yeah, no, I do think it's a nice idea. I mean, it is expensive to produce box sets, I guess, is what I'm told. But it, to me, it, it definitely kind of shows that this is, hey, this is the whole series now. You could own the whole thing. Right. Um, so I, I agree. But it is. It's a it's a good series. It's a fun series. Like I said, all the books have done really well with, uh, you know, the awards. And, um, you know, and even okay. though parents get spooked sometimes, you know, I just have to say, hey, look. It's okay. They're Catholic. It's, <laughs> it's, it's more like Scooby Doo than uh, than anything else. You know, that's kind of the other. You know, remember Scooby Doo? It oh, I love like, Scooby Doo. <laughs> like, oh my gosh, there's a ghost here and there's a ghost there. You know, but then usually uh, there was a natural explanation for things. But um, yeah. Although the church has not ruled out the possibility of ghosts. It's very interesting. <laughs> it is. And I actually have those kinds of discussions. Because book two is my ghost story with the haunted no. cathedral. Those are some of the questions that Zan, my uh, you know precocious teenager, asked the monk. Like, well, hey, wait a, minute, wait a minute. You teach us about the saints and how we should talk to the saints and this kind of thing. So why are you so against this idea of ghosts? And, you know, the monk is like the cathedral is not haunted by a ghost of a little girl. And Zan's like, well, why, why couldn't it be like, you know, what about all this stuff you teach me about the saints? And, you know, so there's, there's that whole thing, you know, in book two also is like the difference between ghosts and saints. Um, You know, book three is about pride. So there's actually a lot in there about the pride of man and the fall goes back to the garden of Eden. Um, You know, my title, the fire of Eden sort of, you know, brings up that idea of the pride of man um, like I said, book four was my my witch story, you know, vanity book. But book four talks, uh, you know, again about like if you read the the Bible, it's filled with references to witches and witchcraft, and you know how how sinful that is and why you shouldn't do it. Um, you know, King Saul. I referenced the story of King Saul and the witch of Endor, where Saul actually you know consults this witch of Endor who who conjures up the spirit of uh, of uh, Samuel, the prophet. And, you know, Samuel's spirit basically says King Saul is going to die the next day in battle with his kids, you know, and he puts this like, you know, horrible, you know, prediction, and then it comes true. And it's like, that's right there in the Old Testament, you know, and so the stuff is there. It's um, there. <laughs> and you know, you and, don't want to know that they're there. <laughs> yeah. And, and book six just is the one that is, you know, Loyola got a little bit like, okay, we really need to raise raise the age range for book six because uh, book six explores the possibility of uh, demon possession. Actually, so it's it's sort of my my uh, my horror genre. You know, kind of each each book has sort of a different type of a genre associated with it. Um, and I'm one, always fascinated. People don't know that at every baptism there's an exorcism. 
Yes. That's I'm always, I love that. It's very fascinating. People are like, what? No. And I'm like, oh, yeah, every, every baptism has an exorcism. Just yeah, to be on don't, the safe side. <laughs> and we don't want to talk about it. We don't want to scare the you know, bejesus out of our kids. But at the same right. time, you know, um, we don't want to make them think that the nothing in this world, you know, exists, you know, in the spiritual dimension, you know, either, because that's not the reality either. And, you know, so yeah, threading those needles, <laughs> yeah, threading those needles, there are real monsters out there. And, you know, we all have to, you know, um, you know, wage that battle in our own way throughout our lives. Um, so book six sort of goes into that a little bit. So it gets a little bit more serious. And I'm always interested going back to ghosts, you know, the apostles thought Jesus at one point was a ghost, you know, walking on the water. And he says, I'm not a ghost. He goes out of his way to prove he's not a ghost. Um, right. But he never says, don't be ridiculous. Ghosts don't exist. Which always is fascinating. True. You know, he it doesn't is. say, what's wrong with you people? There's no such thing as a ghost. Instead, he says, let me prove to you that I'm not a ghost. <laughs> Yeah, no, look, I think in some ways it's um, the fact that there's so many shows and focal points on like, are there real ghosts? I think at least it keeps people thinking that about the afterlife, because it seems like nowadays we want to just make people, you know, put on blinders and think it's just this world, it's just this life. At least a ghost story makes you think, well, maybe there's something after this life, you know, and then you could start, you know, that's a place to have a conversation or at least to start a conversation. Right. And the church has not said there are no ghosts. The church has said so far, we don't know. We're leaving that question open. We have the communion of saints. You know, we have some connection with the other side and we just don't know what it is. Um, so they've been silent on that issue and leaving it with Jesus just saying, I'm not a ghost. You know, <laughs> I'm curious. Uh, I know we're sort of running out of time here, but what's your, what was your favorite book growing up? The Lord of the Rings. I, the I the still, Rings. Uh, I still will listen to that on audio tape. I love listening to, to you know, British guys reading things like The Lord of the Rings. So I have the entire trilogy, and every year or two, I, I polish it off and listen to it again. Um, and and Tolkien was definitely an influence on um, on my writing and like some of the some of the emotions that I felt reading the book, especially like the end of Return of the King you know, when Samwise comes back to his wife, you know, that very last few pages of Return of the King always invokes, you know, very sentimental melancholy in me. And um, and I wanted some of that. I, wa- I was going for that at the end of book one. I don't know if you felt it, but I, I wanted there to be some melancholy, you know, at the, you know, in some of these mm-hmm. books too. Um, but I should say, by the way, all of these books um, of the Harwood Mysteries have an audio book and they got the same British guy to read the whole series. And he oh, does nice. different accents, you know, Scottish and all these different accents. And it's great. I love listening. He makes the books sound so much better than they are, um, you know, <laughs> when he reads them. But I had a mom come up to me recently and say, you know, my, my son just won't read. He has a hard time reading, um, you know. And I was like, and she was like, I wish there were an audio book. And I was like, oh, there's an audio book. And and she was like, oh, I need it then because we listen to it in the car when we're driving. And, you know, my son will listen to stories that way. So yeah. people who are in that, you know, cage, go on Audible. You can uh, you can find all of the all five of the and the sixth one, too, will all be um, read by the same uh, the same reader. Rafe that's, Beckley. That's, that's awesome. Well, my my grandson, my 10 year old Dylan, he's just finished The Hobbit. And he's starting to dig into the Lord of the Rings. So he's he's been excited. So I'll pass this idea on yeah, to him as well. But it's tough. As a 10-year-old, uh, the fact that he read The Hobbit is amazing. Because nowadays, people feel like the Lord of the Rings just isn't fast-moving enough. And there's too much description and things like that. And so it's nice to see that there are still young kids who can, you know, can still do the Lord of the Rings. But mm-hmm. that's you know part of the reason Harry Potter is so successful is because it it doesn't use the same kind of model. And, you know, and so I I try to, even though I try to channel some Lord of the Rings, um, I really tried to follow more of the the J.K. Rowling model because I felt like that that was a big success with how our kids, you know, respond to, uh, to reading these days. 
Well, I'm looking forward to reading, and I'm glad there is an audio. My oldest grandson, my 17-year-old, while he's reading now, when he was younger, reading was very difficult for him. But he went the audio route, and um, you know that was that was great. You know, so he's listened to a zillion books on audio, and now he's reading more. His reading, he's a little slightly dyslexic. Um, so that's slowly improved. But I think it's great when there's audio books. When I traveled with my four kids, um, we did a lot of audio books. Um, and in case sometimes they were adult books. I can remember at one point this, this adult book as we were traveling was getting like racier and racier. And I was like, oh, where is this <laughs> going to go? You know, and at one point, my uh I think it was my son, Dan, who's now like 36 or 37. He was about seven, six or seven at the time. He leaned forward from the back seat and said, Mom, I think it's time to shut this off or fast forward. <laughs> and I said, yeah, I think so, too. I think we were listening to, um, mm-hmm. what is that book, In the Garden of Good and Evil, that oh. book in New Orleans. <laughs> we you were, you were bold. We, we got to, to this to racing part, and I was like, oh, dear. Yeah, I think you're right. I was, like, ready to hit the fast forward button. We used to love playing uh, – it's not a Catholic show, but it's a it's – Midnight a, in the Garden of Good and Evil. <laughs> yeah, not, Midnight in the Garden – that is definitely that. not a religious <laughs> – Story, but we used to listen to Adventures in Odyssey, which was a, a nice Protestant uh, kind of radio show that was that we got, and the kids loved hearing those episodes. You know, each one was like thirty minutes, and that was a lot of fun for them. But yeah, audio is great. We listened to everything from religious to Midnight in the Garden. <laughs> when yeah. I had a fifteen-hour driving day, it had to get a little. I had to put on the adult book. Whatever it takes, it. right, to get to get you there safely. <laughs> but I'd hit the fast forward. <laughs> oh, goodness. Well, Dan was reading um, Happy Own when he was 10. So, um, you know, he the, my kids were all pretty voracious readers. Um, and at one point, my daughter, um, when she was 11 or 12, she had, she was a crazy, amazing reader speed reader I couldn't keep up with what she could read but she'd read all of the Lucy Maud Montgomery books yeah. which were wonderful and then one day she came to me and she said could we go to Prince Edward Island and see where Lucy Maud Montgomery lived and I said sure I thought like it was right above Maine <laughs> so I said well if you set up the trip you plan the trip and uh, set up you know where we're going to stay on the island I'll do the driving so she did all of that. She called. She made arrangements. She was 12. She did everything. Then she handed me the map. <laughs> I was like, it's way past Maine. <laughs> I think it was the whole trip was about 1,500 miles altogether. But wow. Yeah, you committed the yourself there. <laughs> so I took the two girls and off we went to Prince Edward Island. And it was it was wonderful. I think they were maybe like 11 and 12 at the time. So that was, we homeschooled as well. So we were able to do things like that. Yeah. So you could get the vibe of what, you know, what I was doing in shadow in the dark there, right. As a homeschooling mom, you know, we don't do anything without finding a way to educate as part of it. That was sort of my philosophy. Like let's have a good story. Let's, you know, scare them a little bit, but they're going to learn something at the end of this, you know? Right. Right. That's wonderful. Is there anything that you wanted to mention that we sort of missed in that's really important to you about um, your book? You know, just, uh, you know, supporting Catholic authors and Catholic literature, I think, is important and, and, and modern Catholic literature. You know, like I said, there's a lot of us out there. Uh, you know, one thing we didn't mention, uh, you know, so I've got my Penny series, which I might actually have a second book coming out maybe in 2026 with OSV on that. We, we're still discussing it. So there may be a Penny sequel. Um, and then I've got the, you know, Harwood Mysteries, which will end. Um, so that's sort of like my younger kids, my middle kids up to young adult. I actually have a, another series uh, for adults coming out starting in uh, February of 2025. Um, from Chrism Press, another uh, small Catholic press. Um, and this one's really targeted for, you know, um, you know, new adults, not really for, for teens, definitely not little kids. Um, and it's it's called Incarnate. Um, and so that's going to be a trilogy. I'm actually in the middle of writing book two this summer. So that's my next project. Um, so that will be my sort of adult project. And, um, you know, let's just well, say the point. 
You'll have to come back and talk about those two then. Yeah, yeah, definitely. The uh, The premise of that one is what would happen if somebody tried to clone Jesus Christ? And, uh, and, and, and you can imagine all the places that a book like that could go. Um, I, I needed to, to go with a Catholic publisher on that to make sure I didn't say anything heretical in the process, <laughs> but it, it's, it's a neat way to explore this idea of, of the natures of, of Jesus, you know, the human and divine nature of Jesus in the context of kind of like this almost apocalyptic kind of series. So I'm having fun with that one. Interesting. Where can people get your books? Uh, all right. So, of course, you can always go to places like Amazon, Barnes & Noble, ChristianBook.com. They're, they're all on there. You can go to the publisher's websites. Loyola Press does the Harwood Mysteries. Our Sunday Visitor does uh, Penny and the Stolen Chalice. Um, and uh, my website is uh, AntonyColank.com. That will have links to all of these things and tell you more about me. And you can actually request me to be a speaker there. Um, but what I like to say is go to your local bookstore, you know, um, your independent bookstore, your Catholic bookstore, your mom and pop shop. I assure you they are struggling and uh, and and get the books from them if you can order, you know, ask them to order it or stock it on their shelves if they don't have it. Um, real quick story. This last week I was at Niagara Falls um, and we went to the National Shrine. I don't know if you know this. I didn't know it. There's a National Shrine to Our Lady of Fatima right outside of Niagara Falls. And I went there for Mass on Sunday and they had a gift store. And I was like, oh, let's go in the gift store and see what they have. And they had a bunch of books. And I was with Corinna Turner, who's actually one of these uh, British Catholic teen book authors. We were having a Catholic teen meetup uh, there, Catholic teen books meetup. And we were walking through the store and it's like, oh, let's see if they have your books, Corinna. And they had Penny and the Stolen Chalice on the shelf of uh, the, the the shrine there. And it was, uh, I'm going to do a little social media post. So um, that's great. I love to see the books in hard copy in a Catholic bookstore. So yes, please go there um, first if you can. But if you're like my wife and you need to order everything on Amazon, that's fine. That's Get me. <laughs> That's me. It's so bad. <laughs> yeah, we get like twelve deliveries a day to my door from Amazon. It's just you it's tell crazy. my husband that I order something every day. He's like, "What is wrong with you?" <laughs> exactly. Yes, that's where I'm at. But but I think it's a girl thing, you know. Maybe, maybe the it's hunt like with the gatherers, you know. It's your birthday every day. Ooh, what's coming to my door today? <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Love it. Well, thank you so much. This has been delightful. Um, could you end us with a prayer, please? Sure, absolutely. And thank you for having me on the show, Kiki. I really appreciate it. And I love talking to you. You're a lot of fun. Um, all right. <laughs> Let's go ahead and pray in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, we just ask you to bless Kiki and her show. Bless her, her listeners and watchers. Bless all of us who are producing uh, Catholic content for our teens, for our children, and for our adults. Help lead us in the faith and help us to follow you throughout our lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Yeah, don't let them read Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil. Yeah, don't read that one. That's 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 heresy. <laughs> but, uh... Oh, Lord have mercy. Things we go through as homeschoolers. <laughs> <laughs> The learning curve was always interesting. <laughs> Thank yeah, you so yeah. much, Tony. Appreciate Thank you, Kiki. This. Take care. God bless you. God bless. Stay in touch. <laughs> Hello, God's beloved. I'm Annabelle Mosley, author, professor of theology, and host of Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. I invite you to listen in and find inspiration along this sacred journey we're traveling together to make our lives a masterpiece and, with God's grace, become saints. Join me, Annabelle Mosley, for Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. God bless you. Remember, you're never alone. God is always with you. Thank you for listening to a production of WCAT Radio. Please join us in our mission of evangelization. And don't forget, love lifts up where knowledge takes flight.